Hi, Mr. Pulley here for Fieldcrest History of Western Civilization, and today we're going to look at Islam. I know, technically not part of Western civilization, but it is one of the largest religions in the world with 1.62 billion followers, about 23% of the world's population. Uh, its believers added to the knowledge from the Greeks and Romans. In fact, they are the ones who had that knowledge brought back to Europe during the Crusades and Middle Ages. Unfortunately, what a lot of people know about Islam is these guys. And these guys follow the teachings of Islam about as much as these two guys follow the teachings of Christianity. Yeah, not at all. And that's how I connect to these guys to And that's a little bit about To get started with our overview, let's look at Muhammad. He's seen as early on an ordinary kind of guy here. Uh, he's orphaned at a very young age, grows up, becomes a caravan driver, and eventually marries his boss, the widow Khadija. He's looking for more to life than just money, and so he goes out and meditates, and he's visited by the angel Gabriel to give him a final revelation from God for humanity. Well, he's persecuted when he comes back and tells people his beliefs, and eventually flees to Medina. Okay. He eventually, however, will turn to Mecca and the pagan practices there and change greatly the beliefs of the Arabian Peninsula. By the time he dies in 632, he's united most of the Arabian Peninsula. So a Muslim or a Muslim is one who submits to God. It's a follower of Islam. And the Quran is their sacred book. It's the word of God transmitted to Muhammad through the archangel Gabriel. It becomes the basis of their law and their daily lives. It's also written in Arabic. And it becomes the unifying language of the Middle East and North Africa. And in fact, as people are taught to read, the Quran is actually used as a school book. Okay, so there are five pillars or duties of Islam, the first of which is a declaration of faith. There is no God but God, and Muhammad is his prophet. Its regular prayer is prescribed, that's five times daily, the giving of charity or alms to the poor, fasting during the holy month of Ramadan, and it's not a month of fasting. It's fasting from sunrise until sunset during the lunar month of Ramadan, which varies throughout the year in terms of when it falls because it follows the lunar calendar as opposed to the Gregorian calendar. And finally, a pilgrimage or a hajj to Mecca once in your lifetime, if at all possible. So Islam will spread very rapidly across the Arabian Peninsula, the Middle East, and North Africa. And why? It's got a simple an easy to understand message. It's got an understandable God. It's got straightforward beliefs and duties. You follow the five pillars of Islam, you have those beliefs, you follow those rules, those duties, and you're going to be rewarded in paradise. It's got understandable rewards. Great, straightforward. You follow the duties, you get the rewards. It's got moving and inspiring Holy Scripture in the Quran. And again, that Quran becomes the basis of Arabic with that unifying language. It's even used in schools to teach students to read. Now that spread. After two years after Muhammad's death, all of Arabia is united. And in fact, after 10 years, the Persian Empire, all the way to Pakistan, Syria, Palestine, and even Egypt are under the influence of Islam. Eventually North Africa and into Europe. Why? Religious inspiration, as we said before. And also mutual exhaustion of the Byzantines, the Byzantine Empire, and the Persians who've been fighting each other for literally centuries. And the humanity of Islam versus that tribal life. And there are also tax advantages, as we talked about in class, of becoming a Muslim. Non-Muslims are required to pay a tax, but they are not, however, required to serve in the military as Muslims within an empire would be. So in terms of that spread, depending on the map you look at, in the uh, time period of Muhammad, about one-third to one-half of the Arabian Peninsula has been unified by Islam. By the uh, end of the first four caliphs, we see most of the Middle East. By the Umayyad dynasties and the caliphs of the, that empire, we're going to see that we spread all the way into Kabul, all the way to what is today Pakistan, across all of Northern Europe, all of Spain and Portugal, and into modern-day France, where they're stopped at the Battle of Tours, by that guy with a great nickname, Charles the Hammer Martel. That's again at the Battle of Tours in 732. Now, other maps show that most of the Arabian Peninsula was uh, 
conquered by the time of Muhammad's death. And again, showing that same spread uh, and then showing also in here where the Byzantine Empire is, which we'll be looking at next. Okay, today there are two main groups of Islam. The first group is the Sunni Muslims. This is 90% of the population of Muslims in the world today. This branch accepts the first four caliphs as rightful successors of Muhammad and accept the hadiths or traditions narrated by the companions. Generally, the closer they are to Muhammad, the better the hadith is. The second group is the Shiite or Shia Muslims. These are 10% of the Muslims in the world. Now, Shia Muslims believe in Ali, Muhammad's cousin and grandson, is the first imam and his rightful successor. They believe only the descendants of Muhammad can be the successor. So they reject the legitimacy of the first three caliphs, although the fourth caliph, accepted by both, is Ali. Today in the world, Islam spread throughout the world, throughout the Middle East, North Africa, and uh, Eastern Africa, but also into the East Indies. In fact, the world's population center with the largest Muslim population in the world is not in the Middle East, but in Indonesia. That's our quick overview of Islam for History of Western Civilization. Again, I'm Mr. Pulley.